Hi everyone, this is Dr. Rahman, live from Hollywood, California. You are watching this show, Hollywood Doc Show. And uh, it's beautiful outside here, but it's still people are sitting inside the home because of the COVID. Really, it's like kind of like not a very good situation. People, they should go out and enjoy the weather, enjoy, enjoy the weather outside, especially summer here in California, which is beautiful because we have different kind of weather. We have a, we have a beach, we have a, we have a mountains, you name it, everything is here. And I hope we will get rid of this COVID situation soon. Today I have a very unique guest. He is a board certified cardiothoracic anesthesiologist. He's here to discuss the field of integrative medicine, especially his clinic, Neuro Relief Academy and Infusion Therapy for clients struggling with mental health, chronic pain, and addiction. He did his Residency from University of California Irvine in anesthesiology, and also he did his fellowship from USC Cardiothoracic Surgery. Please welcome uh, Dr. Harris. Dr. Harris, welcome to the show. How are you? I'm great. Thank you so much for having me. Thank you. First, uh, people, you know, they were asking me. I have a huge uh, physician circle, and they were asking me the current situation, how we can, um, you know, introduce a new technology. But the thing what you are working is really something like a, it's like a brand new technology. It's like a uniquely designed this innovation. I spoke to my, uh, some of my chairs actually in the hospital and they even wanted to know, I mean, what exactly they feel. Oh my God, it's amazing. I wanted to know, I wanted to start first thing, you know, tell me about uh, integrative medicine. What is integrative medicine? For sure, I'm glad you asked. Uh, integrative medicine basically is the stepping back from how we have become so uber specialized in the fact that each physician has a very pointed focus. Uh, the integrative medicine um, standpoint is that it's important to take a look at the broad picture as well. That when someone comes in for, let's say, a sprained knee, that in addition to that, we're also looking at all aspects of that patient's chart and how we can best optimize it. And that includes the whole body approach, both the physical, the psychological, et cetera. Wonderful, okay. So now I'll get back to your real topic, actually, the ketamine infusion. Seriously, I wanted to know, uh, a lot of people, they wanted to know, this show is going uh, live nationally and internationally. Basically, it's not live, definitely won't be recording. But I just want to ask you a few things. Number one question, I have like a couple of questions and I'm sure you know you, you should be able to help me and uh, explain me better so I understand exactly what your, your team is doing over there. How did you first come across these techniques? Well, that takes me back a ways. Actually, even before I was in my anesthesia training, when I was in my uh, medical training in general, you know, so much memorization. And uh, one of the things that stood out to me when we were doing our pharmacology uh, training was there was this one medication. It seemed to be all off on its own. It was unique in the fact that its category had nothing else like it. It was sort of, uh, Sort of a boogeyman of pharmacology in that it had been around for so long but wasn't really discussed because it was so old so there was always something new that you know anesthesiologists prefer because it was easier yeah and about the internship in new york um we do rotations throughout the hospital in the icu in the er and i was really interested to see the er physicians utilizing ketamine in certain situations where they were, you know, let's say relocating a shoulder or splinting a cast, where it was like short periods of semi-lucency with the patient that solved the pain control issues, but also the anxiety issues and kept everything very still, very calm. And yet the patients were never really asleep. They were never really truly anesthetized. Um, they just sort of sat there and they were awake, they were breathing on their own, didn't require anything else. And uh, a little bolus of ketamine and a, a, sometimes a, a low dose brief infusion. And the procedure was done. They would uh, come back more and more to being you know, increasingly verbal and no ill toward effects. And it was just really surprising because it ran contrary to everything we're talking about, sedation. And 
I just thought that was really cool. Yep. Uh, led into the anesthesia training, of course, uh, which got more in depth, but still in general anesthesia, it's very seldom used. There's always something easier. Uh, it wasn't until I got to my cardiothoracic fellowship that we utilized it quite a bit actually, because the cases that we were seeing were so much more intense with so much more uh, instability in the patient's hemodynamics that it became a very useful tool. Mm -hmm. So that's where I first came across it. Wow, wonderful. So how did you uh, come to be so heavily involved in this field? I know that, like, I know I, we are from the same city. And I, I mean, uh, you know, you are one of the, the famous person in this field. And uh, what I can say, not the famous, you're the only person I see in Los Angeles area who is basically very famous and everybody wants to be a part, wants to get some help from you. So how come, you know, you're so heavily involved in this specific field? You know, sometimes things just feel like a calling. So when I was out of training and in private practice now, sure, I would do open heart surgeries, which is the cardiothoracic background. We do a lot of general, um, of pediatrics, many other different kinds of cases. And what I was finding was I could integrate some of the ketamine knowledge in general everyday surgeries. And the results that I was seeing were really astounding. It was really prominent that in addition to receiving the appropriate anesthesia the accomplished the surgery that when they were recovering let's say just right after in the in the recovery room they would display these really remarkable improvements in other areas that had nothing to do with the operation that they were there for so take for example purely theoretical let's say you have a 55 year old lady mm -hmm. with a history of really horrible lower back pain, has had multiple surgeries, but still very disabled. Um, she is understandably depressed and anxious and um, lives in pain every day, um, has weakness and therefore twisted her knee and is now coming in for a knee arthroscopy. Very simple procedure. Um, but in addition to reviewing her chart, I also see, you know, this poor lady is on just huge doses of several different kinds of uh, pain medication, some opiates, some others. And, you know, she's just coming in for a knee surgery, but I would look at that situation. I would say, what can we do? What else can we do while we're here besides, you know, just facilitate the surgery on the knee? So, whereas a lot of anesthesiologists would sort of go through a very uh, normal pattern inducing with propofol, put in an LMA, turn the gas on, and then just repeat the procedure, you know, two hours later or so. Uh, went about a different way. I would actually induce with ketamine, which is extremely rare outside of some severe trauma settings or pericardial effusion, something like that. Mm -hmm. And um, plus or minus an LMA because they stay breathing on their own. Um, completely pain-free, totally still, uh, unaware of what's going on. Um, possibly add just a, a very small touch of gas. Um, and then when the procedure was closing, turn off this low dose ketamine infusion that I had been running the entire time. Mm -hmm. And when a person like this would wake up in the recovery room, their whole affect was pronounced in, in its difference to where she was before. Okay. So, uh, it started to really pop out to our nurses because a lot of times they see the patients before and after surgery. And maybe before surgery, you know, this poor lady was just really anxious, um, you know, sort of in, in that sort of, what, what's the point? My life is, is too difficult, you know, I don't even care anymore, um, in a lot of pain. To afterwards, she wakes up totally lucid, no side effects from anesthesia, no nausea, no uh, sort of uh, grogginess, just right awake, um, super happy, just chatting with all the nurses, uh, and just very upbeat. Her depression and anxiety would be lifted. And uh, in addition to not having any pain in her knee, mm -hmm. she didn't have any pain in her back for the first time in 25 years. Okay. And probably most striking at all would be the fact that she's not asking for any pain medication whatsoever. Mm -hmm. And this is someone who's opiate dependent, so their requirements are super high. Mm -hmm. so you put all this together and you realize something really remarkable has taken place. Oh. And it's it's very shocking. It really draws you into wanting to figure out 
what's going on here and you know how can we how can we use this in more situations how does the caribbean help with the mental stress so like with mental health yeah mental health yeah i mean sorry yeah few decades of research and the invention of some really important technology like uh, fMRIs and spec CTs where we can actually tag certain enzymes um, and display their concentration gradients let's say in different areas of the brain or other nerve tissue and then link that with uh, functional studies so like seeing someone actually improve in a very specific category being able to measure that we were able to figure out that Ketamine was extremely effective, uh, not in just treating depression, which it is, you know, it does treat that quite often, but also PTSD, obsessive compulsive disorder, generalized anxiety disorder, uh, postpartum and bipolar depression. Um, so quite a list, but the, the how was really interesting. So I, I'd say that there's the macro and the micro level. Mm -hmm. On the macro level, the meditative state that a person is in when they're undergoing ketamine therapy is i it's akin to someone having a, a therapy session with themselves um, it removes a lot of the defense barriers the mechanisms that we normally have on a daily basis that sort of stop us from thinking about the things that really matter just everything gets you know pushed to the side or pushed down and uh, we don't process things in the moment sometimes ever it, from years in the past and this does build up and it then starts to spill over in our daily lives. Emotions, our reactions to things, our perspectives. So it gives a client the opportunity to review from an objective uh, perspective. So a lot of people feel like they're sort of trapped in their own movie. Mm -hmm. When they're experiencing ketamine, they actually ha get to step outside. Okay. They're watching the movie instead except instead of feeling trapped, it's like they now have directorial discretion. So they can actually observe sort of how they are, how they react to certain things, um, relive certain things that maybe normally would have been traumatic, but in this really safe, warm, pleasant environment, they're able to actually process that in a healthy fashion and sort of discard that and move on past it. Mm -hmm. and that really benefits in their daily lives. Oh, wow. The, the macro. And then the micro level gets a lot more in detail. Mm -hmm. um, basically, what takes place is three major categories. Uh -huh. the, the ketamine's not, it's not the cure, okay? It's just the on switch. Mm -hmm. It triggers a, a secondary cascade of enzymes that are normally produced in the body that haven't been produced enough to be produced more, such as brain-derived neurotrophic factor, or BDNF, which is responsible not only for overall nerve cell health, but actually to rebalance the relationship between, we hear about neurotransmitters and receptors a lot, especially in modern psychiatry. Well, we always focus on the presynaptic release of neurotransmitters like serotonin, norepinephrine, dopamine, et cetera. But before ketamine, we were never focused on the other side of that equation, which is postsynaptic receptor number and function. So ketamine actually starts a reaction that replaces the receptor number and function, which improves overall functionality no matter what the starting amount of say serotonin was that was being expressed. Oh, wonderful, that's a very good explanation. Now I learned a lot, I mean, being a doctor, I mean, this is the knowledge which you are spreading is really good for the physicians as well. They, they need to know how the how the ketamine actually is working like a, in two different ways. So my next question is, the, I know we use it for more like an acute condition, but how ketamine help with the chronic pain? Um, well, chronic pain, um, to those that uh, understand the basics of the nervous system, what's on in the brain is off in the body. So they're, they're inverted from each other. So whereas in the brain where we're trying to increase the number of postsynaptic receptors okay. in the peripheral nervous system where we experience pain especially chronic pain which happens when there's been some sort of nerve damage something has uh, altered anatomically that it can't be easily just put back the way it was 
whether that be a, a burn or a crush injury or um, any sort of nerve damage um, where the body experiences that as an ongoing trauma because it doesn't understand why the stimulus hasn't stopped. Mm -hmm. And it gets louder and louder and louder as it tries to be heard thinking that, well, we must do something about this. Mm -hmm. That translates into an increase in postsynaptic receptors so that the uh, signal that's getting passed gets louder and louder mm -hmm. as well as the rate of the stimulus. So the ion gated calcium channels are responsible so for the firing rate. Mm -hmm. Just being a normal stimulus like I stug my toe okay. is a sort of a repetitive firing that increases over time and therefore you get this sort of tolerance issue with medication trying to treat it because you're always in this um, in this sort of arms race trying to keep keep up with okay. what the body's doing what the medication's doing and the ketamine reverses that process through a similar uh, enzyme mechanism that actually can reset it back to a baseline and we see a lot of our clients can um, really decrease the amount of pain medication they're using increase functionality okay. as well as uh, possibly even come off medications altogether so uh, my next question is uh, it's actually it's a very uh, tricky question how does ketamine help with substance abuse which is a very important topic and I'm sure you know you understand like that <laughs> most people understand ketamine as uh, well something we invented in the 60s and then it was a club drug or a special K um, it was popular for a while, a little less so now, but it's still out there, um, which was a powder form that was manufactured in some, you know, you know underground labs, so to speak. Mm -hmm. But one thing that we weren't aware of before was that we knew that while it was ketamine was a drug of abuse in that powder form, mm -hmm. what we do is actually in an intravenous route that's perfectly controlled uh, every second, the adjustment of the dose, the rate and everything like that correlates with our assessment of our client's psychological and physiologic state. So that's one plus in this, the delivery mechanism that we use. But additionally, we actually now know ketamine is actually not addictive. Oh. So it's abused, but it's not addictive. There's no dependency, either uh, physical or psychological, unlike a lot of other um, recreational drugs. And I would never encourage it to be used recreationally. But in the right hands, in the right setting, we now realize it's a really useful tool to actually treat addiction. So wow. Whether, really? Yeah, whether it's uh, opiates or uh, alcohol, benzodiazepines, methamphetamine, cocaine, we see uh, an enormous uh, benefit when used uh, synergistically with a, a recovery program to reset the receptors back to a point before they actually became dependent on whatever the substance is. And therefore, it eliminates the withdrawals because the body doesn't see the dependency. Okay, wonderful. I think that's a good explanation. I mean, I mean, uh, if it's you know the physiology, exactly, you know, how does it work? I mean, that's wonderful. I mean, it, it makes sense, I think that. So let me ask you one more question. How does the model of neuro relief differ from other clinics like uh, integrative medicine model? Right, so, um, there are a, a few clinics that have popped up um, and uh, while I don't know of all of them, um, there are some that uh, operate like us with this sort of uh, larger perspective, the integrative medicine uh, approach where you're not just coming to give someone ketamine, you push a button and they leave, um, but you have to analyze the entire situation. So all of our clients uh, are walked through this process and, and we're the guide. Mm -hmm. And whether it's physical ailments, uh, psychological ailments, or just uh, emotional trauma that has built up over time, as someone goes through the therapeutic process and those defense mechanisms start to drop, having someone that can actually focus on their individual needs and help them to make positive steps in the right direction, whether it's better mature coping mechanisms uh, for mental health, uh, helping them get connected with appropriate physical therapy and increased uh, functionality with 
helps in terms of lifestyle and people becoming more active and healthy, or in the case of uh, substance abuse, integrating a very seamlessly with their recovery program so that there's really a whole care team there. And, uh, and we all sort of circle the wagons for that individual. Okay, wonderful. So I think we have learned a lot in terms of your ketamine thing, in terms of everything, what you've been doing actually, what we wanted to know. Now let me ask you a few more things actually, you know, other than the ketamine thing. Do you offer any other services at the Neuro Relief? I know Neuro Relief is one of the, the most pioneer private practice area in this neighborhood. I'm talking about the Los Angeles, greater Los Angeles area. So people want to know, and in fact, you know, the entire world, everybody wants to know because we have a patient come from different parts of the world as well. So my question is, do you really, do you offer any other services at Neuro Relief as well? Uh, yes, thanks for asking. So one of the things that we see a lot, um, many clients come to us after having tried uh, other therapies, other medications, psychiatric, etc. cetera. Um, while I think all these medications are useful tools in the right hands, in the right person, we do find uh, there's a lot of situations where people have tried a bunch of different medications. And sometimes they're very effective. Uh, one of the things that we do see is a across the board a uh, a drop in certain micronutrients mm -hmm. that seems to be fairly predictable and dependent on which medication it is that they were chronically using. One of the things that we do to increase and sort of synergize with the ketamine therapy and the integrative medicine is micronutrient infusion replacements. Okay. You know, it comes from several uh, independent uh, formulations. In addition to, we're actually able to provide each client with a customized replacement protocol. So we would take a blood test and send that off to a specialized laboratory that can test for over 20 different micronutrients. Okay. And we take those results and we bring it to our compounding partners. And they, actually, they uh, create a completely new uh, infusion that's customized totally to that individual and that we could use that synergistically with the ketamine protocols that we're using and it really just helps people get that optimal level of improvement wonderful wonderful that's very wonderful so uh where do you see your model evolving well um i think that you know ketamine has uh as of now we have probably the best um, data with ketamine than we do for maybe any other alternative uh, medication substances or uh, implants in some ways that may actually not be the same, but they also may have properties that, again, in combination with, uh, we call it psychedelic assisted psychotherapy, and that is by merging a lot of these integrated uh, techniques together with uh, you know specialized infusions that are fully customized with therapy together at the same time, along with the lifestyle modifications, the nutrition and the uh, physical activity combined with life coaching. And when you merge all these things together into what I personally see as what wellness really is, it's, it has to be multifaceted. It has to work together to achieve a result that is customized for that person because all of our different goals and where we've come from are so different. That's that's really where I see this evolving into. That's wonderful. You know, Dr. Harris, uh, 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 I, see, I see this topic as the precision therapy. So I think what Neuro Relief is doing, they are talking, they're providing more detail as a precision medicine. So what exactly you're saying? So definitely by saying this, what I wanted to ask you, what future direction do you see for this emerging field, which is definitely innovative, very promising, and I'm sure people want to know what direction actually we're heading for this emerging field, for emerging field. No, that's, it's very exciting because um, I think that now that a lot of pretty overwhelming data has, has been able to 
can be brought to light um, in combination with uh, the use of, you know, the world being a smaller place now and, and the way that we're able to spread information now. Mm -hmm. um, a lot more people are becoming aware of it um, and that gives the opportunity to possibly broaden from just sort of like the individual clinics to full integration. So, you know, when, when they come up with a new technique, usually what they do is they use it as like a last resort. Mm -hmm. And for example, you know, you had to be like very like hospitalized with depression before you could use Prozac at first. Mm -hmm. And then eventually as we become accustomed to it culturally, it moves forward towards more of the, maybe not the first thing in line, although some people may feel that that's the right move for them, mm -hmm. but certainly more towards the mainstream in that uh, primary care or other specialties such as psychiatry, psychology, neurology, pain management, physical therapy, uh, addiction recovery, et cetera, would think of us as partners, mm -hmm. uh, an integrative piece of the integrative medicine uh, model the, of the puzzle that could be brought in and utilized at any time mm -hmm. for their patients uh, that come to them primarily but that they know that we could be used as a tool uh, earlier on in the in the in the protocol oh wonderful wonderful uh, I guess uh, um, pretty much we cover all the topic you know what uh, I was thinking what I have in my mind uh, is there anything uh, you think, I mean, any last word for the healthcare community? Because uh, the audience we have, mostly they are physicians. Uh, mostly people, they are watching the program, you will see they are physicians. And then the primary audience and then the secondary audience, we have people who are basically outside like the public, general public. So this topic, this show is the reason uh, why we decided to brought this show so then we can pass this information to everyone around the world. So the show is not only for the US, but also a lot of people that are watching internationally. So my next question is any last word for national and international health community or for prospective clients out there? Well, thank you. Um, you know, what's interesting is actually internationally, for example, in India and China, they actually use ketamine quite a bit. It's it's almost a mainstay of anesthesia in, in a lot of other countries. And uh, they may actually um, have more people that are, have used it or um, are using it in medical practice. So um, I would just encourage our international uh, brothers and sisters just to see if you can take it one step further. And you know, using those skills, there, there could be real opportunities to to start this sort of model and integrate it into the healthcare systems abroad, um, because you know the, the results we're seeing are just they're truly spectacular, and it's so gratifying to be able to see clients get such improvements so quickly. And I would just want to spread that to um, you know basically far and wide uh, to to clients. I think it's important that they be put at ease. Um, that from an experiential point of view, that it's extremely safe. We don't see any major long-term side effects at all. Um, we, we have sort of a, a meditative environment. So a client sits in a relaxed uh, electronic uh, recliner chair with a, a sleep mask for their eyes, uh, noise canceling Bluetooth headphones with uh, meditation music, in a candlelit room with the blankets and it's all completely private. One person, one room uh, allows a person to really internalize and remove distractions. And, um, and that's really where you get the best results. So it's a very pleasant experience um, that I would just want to put people at ease that were hearing about something like this for the first time. Wonderful. So uh, now let me ask you one thing. What if people want to contact you? What do you prefer? Do you have any uh, website or any specific number or your contact person? I know it's hard to, to reach you. You are such a busy, I mean, seriously, I mean, it's just like, I totally understand your schedule is so busy and you are just everywhere. But definitely other than this topic, other than this show, we would like all you to call you uh, to our hospital and give a talk. But I wanted to know how people can reach out to you. 
Well, um, one of the things I think that makes this unique is our availability. Um, we guide our clients through a very concierge sort of model. So seven days a week, about 18 hours a day, there's always going to be someone that's available. Okay. Um, our information is on our website at www.neuroreliefketamine.com, all one word, and including contact phone numbers, email addresses. There are contact forms on there, so um, all you have to do is, is let us know that uh, you need some information, how we might help you, and someone will contact you. And just don't feel, feel free to call us anytime. Um, the people that work here love what they do and uh, we'd be more than happy to help other people find relief. Dr. Harris, wonderful. Seriously, I just feel like I learned a lot. I mean, I, I, mean, I can imagine like uh, the entire community, the medical community, it, it just, uh, it just uh, we feel like we are honored you are here. And also uh, the knowledge and the topic and your practice is definitely giving a, giving a very good benefit, passing a good benefit to our patient. And I would like to say thanks for coming and joining our program. Yeah. And, uh, and um, uh, basically, I wanted to start this program live from my studio. But uh, as you know, the situation is very bad. COVID is like, I have no idea what's going to happen and when we will get the vaccine. And uh, do you, uh, I know it's uh, other than uh, what do you do. And in fact, you know, I am not a COVID specialist, but uh, what do you have any say? Uh, by looking at the pandemic situation, when the thing is going to be normal, and well, I would really, I mean, I know it's out of the context, it's just between. No, not at all, not at all. I mean, physicians should should pay attention to, we should be attempting to maintain, you know, a knowledge level and things besides what we're just doing today. Um, I actually have been following it quite closely. And I think one of the things that differs now from when, you know, there were so many unknowns before, um, data, reliable data now is it is showing that while it is quite contagious, that the mortality rate is far, far, far below. Oh, what, yeah, what we, pretty, what yeah. We, uh, yeah, we we had some pretty worst case scenarios out there at first. It's still dangerous. I think it's still very important that mm -hmm. people that have that, that are in that vulnerable population. I don't necessarily think that there would be any reason to uh, lock down the healthy. Um, I think we understand better that, that uh, now, but certainly the vulnerable people, the, the same ones that are really at risk whenever you have any sort of major outbreak of anything, mm -hmm. would include you know, the elderly, um, anyone with pre-existing conditions, including heart disease, lung problems, kidney issues, liver problems, things like that, that are, are a burden to their, uh, to their health on a chronic basis. And then, you know, anyone who's immunocompromised, okay. so keeping them at greater risk for infection, which would include, um, you know, cancer patients or people with immune deficiencies of some kind. But, you know, uh, normal healthy people, yes, uh, we, we are getting some of those cases. Mm -hmm. um, every single one of them is one too many. Um, yep. But, you know, I think that we're working through it as a society and um, I think together we're, we're going to be just fine. Definitely, definitely. Dr. Harris, thank you so much. I really appreciate uh, joining our program and yeah. hope uh, our audience will get the benefit from this uh, talk. And anybody, anyone wants to contact Dr. Harris, you can directly contact him by checking his website. And I'm sure they have the phone number and uh, 24 by 7 is available. And uh, now, uh, thank you so much, uh, Dr. Harris. Uh, you thank have a great evening. Very grateful. Thank you. Bye-bye.